My name is Tom Finger, and I am a, a researcher, teacher at Stanford University. I have been working in, on, and with China for almost 60 years, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts on prospects for cooperation between the United States and China. The U.S.-China relationship is fraught but not fragile. Washington and Beijing are competitors, but they have many shared interests. Disagreements are inevitable, but conflict can and must be avoided. They can, must, and will find ways to cooperate. The relationship is not nearly as bad as the current narratives in China and the United States would have you believe. The United States and China are different in many ways, but they also have many similarities. Indeed, some of the similarities make them more like one another than Aina is like most other countries. I'll begin with some of the obvious similarities and differences. Both are big countries with large territories, large populations, and large economies. Size matters because geography and demography influence. I use influence advisedly, not determine, which is too strong a term. They influence what governments can and must do. The United States and China have roughly equal land areas, but the United States has more arable land, fresh water, and other natural resources. China's population is more than four times larger than that of the United States and far more homogeneous, but it is also older, aging faster, and declining. The U.S. population is younger, better educated, and still growing. China has more workers and more soldiers, but it also has far more students, retirees, and people living on less than $3 a day. Demography has a profound impact on social needs and social policies. Geography and geopolitics shape relations with neighbors, threat perceptions, and security policies. The United States is bounded by two oceans and two friendly countries. China is a continental power with 14 land neighbors and offshore neighbors that are allied with the United States. Both countries are big, but their factor endowments, perceived needs, and preferred ways to meet domestic and international challenges are often very different. Big countries often have big needs and big ambitions, and that is certainly the case for China and the United States. Both are major importers and exporters major consumers of fossil fuels, and the largest producers of greenhouse gases. Both interact with and depend on dozens of foreign partners, and they bump up against one another on every continent. Our interests in other countries sometimes conflict, but most of the times they're compatible and offer opportunities for cooperation. Both are deeply enmeshed in the global order. What happens in other countries affects their own citizens, firms, and other interests. It is unsurprising, therefore, that both China and the United States try to protect their interests by cultivating relationships and gaining influence through investment, foreign aid, arms sales, and other instruments of foreign policy. This entails both competition and possibilities for cooperation to achieve outcomes from which China, the United States, and the third country partners all benefit. By third country, I mean whatever other country is the object of U.S. or Chinese attention. The fact that both are active around the world gives us a stake in global and regional peace and a well-functioning, rules-based international system. The United States and the People's Republic of China 
abbreviated PRC. Each has special responsibilities for the international order and addressing global challenges by virtue of their permanent seats on the United Nations Security Council. In theory, their international responsibilities should transcend narrow American and Chinese interests. But the position each takes in international organizations and on international issues is often shaped by national considerations. U.S. and PRC interests sometimes clash, but their international responsibilities often involve shared interests and require cooperation. Managing the effects of climate change is one such shared interest and responsibility. Beijing and Washington have different perspectives and priorities, but both recognize that other countries will not undertake meaningful steps to reduce carbon emissions or ameliorate the effects of global warming unless they perceive that China and the United States are on basically the same sheet of music. This is but one of many examples illustrating the imperative for at least limited USPRC cooperation. Both countries proclaim their exceptionalism but think they are special in different ways. Americans think they are different in ways that make the U.S. a model for other that other countries should seek to emulate. Chinese think that they are special in ways that make it impossible for others to be like them. These different concepts of exceptionalism lead, among other things, to different policies governing immigration and naturalization. For example, the U.S. accepts far more migrants and refugees than does China, and immigrants constitute a vastly large percentage of American citizens and permanent residents than they do in China. There are more naturalized citizens in the county where I live, a county with two million people, than in all of China country with 1.4 billion people. China and the United States both face challenges of governing large, diverse territories, but employ very different methods. The PRC was established in 1949, but thinks of itself as the descendant of a unified and unitary Chinese state that has existed for thousands of years. Like Imperial China, the PRC is a unitary state with a strong central government. The U.S., in contrast, thinks of itself as an entirely new political entity that came into existence in 1776 as a federalist system that gives limited powers to the national government and reserves all others to the states and the people. This difference is reflected in their very different national dreams. The American dream, in the American dream, the role of the state is to make it possible for individual citizens to realize their own aspirations. The Chinese version of the national dream holds that it is the dream of every citizen to contribute to the wealth and power of the Chinese nation. Under the Chinese system, the central government has unlimited authority to manage all regions, sectors of the economy, and social activities. Policies are national in scope, and enforcement of uniformity is deemed necessary to preserve social stability and the integrity of the Chinese nation. The American Federalist system was designed to achieve minimal integration of the 13 original states and to accommodate the many economic, religious, ethnic, and other differences that exist in the now much larger and more diverse nation. China's system allows limited scope for provincial, institutional, and individual autonomy. The U.S. system limits central control and tolerates high degrees of state, institutional, and individual autonomy. In both countries, 
the modalities of the different political systems are thought to be necessary to protect national security, promote economic growth, and preserve social harmony. A correlate and consequence of the different origins and structures of the Chinese and American political systems, Americans tend to expect less from and to be more distrustful of government than do people in China. The American system evolved from displeasure with and distrust of British colonial rule and is designed, albeit imperfectly, to limit the scope of government activity and to hold accountable the officials who decide and implement policies. Almost the opposite is true in China. Their people have less ability to shape policy decisions or hold officials accountable, but they generally evince greater trust in their government. The combination of different histories, different conceptions of national identity, and different organization of civil society leads to different forms of organization of civil society. In both the imperial era and until very recently, the basic building block of Chinese society was the extended family. Confucian norms required deference to the always male head of household, clan elders, and ultimately the emperor or government. These norms were co complemented by the de facto delegation of great responsibility to the extended family. It was, and to a considerable extent still is, the responsibility of families to care for their elderly, educate their youth, and provide support to the disabled or unemployed. This, lim this limited expectations of and demands on the state. The situation was and is very different in the United States, where all except the small percentage of indigenous peoples left family and cultures behind when emigrating to America. Lacking extended families to provide support, new arrivals and their descendants form myriad informal, quasi-formal, and formal groupings that became building blocks of civil society. These non-governmental mechanisms and organizations provided a wide range of social services and support mechanisms. In certain respects, they were and are functional equivalents of extended families in China. China has far fewer and much weaker civic organizations. But after two generations of one child per family policies, extended families no longer play the stabilizing role that they did for centuries. My final observation about similarities and differences between China and the United States is that Americans have much greater intolerance for diversity and disorder than do Chinese. Americans prize openness, diversity, and competition and are comfortable with a high degree of disorder. Almost the opposite is true of Chinese society. Where va which values uniformity and stability and has low tolerance for luan, the Chinese word for chaos or disorder. Americans accept dissensus, rivalry, and disorder because they think it contributes to progress. Chinese seek to avoid, to hide, and to limit disputes and disorder because they are seen as endangering social stability economic growth, and political legitimacy. Americans view demonstrations, protests, and disputes as acceptable ways to express dissatisfaction and to change policies and behaviors. Chinese, in contrast, fear disorder and tolerate policies and behavior they dislike because they have higher trust in government and they judge that the only alternative to the current regime is an unacceptable danger of system breakdown, economic recession, and social chaos. This brief summary of similarities and differences omits much that is important. 
but I hope it will inspire some of you to examine more carefully the ways in which the United States and China are alike, dissimilar, or respond to similar challenges in different ways. The two points I wish to underscore here are, one, that China and the United States sometimes act differently because they have different geopolitical challenges, factor endowments, and historical legacies. And second, that the existence of such differences does not automatically lead to animosity or preclude cooperation. A third point uh, worth noting is that in certain respects, for example, size, permanent membership on the UN Security Council, possession of nuclear weapons, the United States and China have more in common with one another than either has with most other countries. Both are major powers whose actions and ambitions affect other countries and the, way, and the international system. Washington and Beijing have different interests and different ways of pursuing those interests, but they also have strong incentives, indeed imperatives, to work together when they can. Other nations attempt to take advantage of U.S.-China competition, but they certainly do not want to be forced to take sides or to become entangled in major power conflict. Third country actions and considerations both drive and constrain what China and the United States do on the world stage. Much more could be said and should be said about all the points made thus far, but I will use the remainder of my time to examine the current state and future prospects of the U.S.-China relationship. The prevailing narratives in both countries emphasize, indeed exaggerate, differences and downplay shared interests and the capacity of political actors to shape policies and national behavior. The narratives also imply or assert that conflict between rising and hegemonic powers is inevitable. Such narratives obscure shaping dynamics and alternative, alternative possibilities by invoking loaded and imprecise labels to characterize what is happening. For example, it is misleading to describe the current situation as a, quote, new Cold War, end quote, or to label China a revisionist power, or for Beijing to describe U.S. policies as containment. It's always better to look at what international actors actually do, and then to assess, not merely assert, why they do it. Current narratives in China and the United States construe decades of engagement as foolish and counterproductive. In the United States, the narrative disparaged U.S. policies as a naive attempt to transform the PRC into a democracy. Those policies, the narrative argues, had the predictable consequence of making China a more formidable challenger to U.S. supremacy. This narrative imputes a political objective that was never a goal of U.S. policy, and it trivializes the significance of policies intended to make China a stronger partner in the protracted struggle with the Soviet Union, to improve the lives of the Chinese people, and to enmesh the PRC in the U.S.-led international system. It downplays the importance of the policy and the relationship to the preservation of peace and the achievement of unprecedented prosperity in East Asia. The Chinese version of the narrative acknowledges the utility of engagement for jump-starting economic growth, but it decries what it describes as Beijing's unwise and unnecessary acceptance of U.S. demands, demands that are described as intended to create dependency and vulnerability that could be exploited by the United States to undermine the legitimacy of China's one-party state. Chinese refer to this as attempt to carry out a color revolution.
Ironically, the Chinese narrative suggests that the American policies of peaceful transformation, as they describe them, were in fact more successful than American critics of the policy hold them to have been. Although neither country puts it this way, both implicitly argue that since engagement was ill-conceived, counterproductive, and dangerous, the corrective and proper policy for the future is disengagement or decoupling. The current but erroneous American narrative contends that U.S. efforts to forge multiple ties between organizations, sectors, and individuals in the United States and China foolishly spawned such things as production and supply chains, collaborative research projects, and other relationships that made the U.S. dangerously dependent on China's, quote, revisionist, unquote, authoritarian regime. The corrective advocates of this view assert is to reshore supply chains to the United States, to restrict investment by American firms in China and Chinese firms in the United States, and to curtail, curtail Chinese access to U.S. universities, corporate enterprises, and other components of American society. Chinese critics of Beijing's engagement with the United States argue that it is imperative for the PRC for PRC security and sustained economic growth to reduce dependence on U.S. markets, capital, and technology. They also argue that China must counter American efforts to change the regime by propagating corrosive liberal and Western ideas via the internet, foreign media, and people-to-people -people ties. Beijing's efforts to reduce dependence and vulnerabilities by further restricting contact with Americans and American ideas can be implemented largely through government policies and control mechanisms. The one-party state has much greater capacity to do this than does Washington, largely because of the differences in the character of the two systems. Washington has much more limited capacity to cajole and even less to compel states, firms, universities, non-governmental organizations, and other players with interests and stakes in China to reduce or terminate activities in the PRC. This does not mean that American players are not scaling back their engagement with China. Many are. But they're doing so largely for commercial reasons or because Beijing has made it too hard to operate or expand, not because Washington has told them to. One consequence of these parallel efforts to curtail interaction is that both sides have somewhat diminished stakes in the success of the other and reduced incentives to press for changes in policy, government policy in both countries. Moreover, the deterioration of real and perceived opportunities on the other side, China in the case of the United States and for the United States in the case of China, is occurring in the context of increasing opportunities for engagement in third countries. U.S.-based firms are expanding or moving into Vietnam, Bangladesh, Malaysia, and elsewhere to diversify portfolios, expand markets, and escape PRC constraints. They are being joined in these and other countries by Chinese firms seeking cheaper labor, access to resources, and new markets. Both sides are acting in ways that decrease the importance of each to the other and reduce the incentives to press for policy change in Beijing and Washington. One additional dimension of the current situation that makes the relationship look worse than it is is the fact that both use the other to justify costly and contentious government actions that in many cases should probably be undertaken for other reasons. For example, both countries point to the putative military threat from the other, 
to justify investments in new weapons systems. After 20 years of war in Afghanistan and Iraq, the United States needs to rebuild military capabilities. Until Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, the only prospective adversary with sufficient heft to justify a $1 trillion U.S. defense budget was China. This was not a mere contrivance because China's military capabilities have improved markedly during the past two decades. The U.S., like other countries, designs equipment and tactics to address the capabilities of the most capable prospective opponent. Right now, that's China, and the PRC is identified as the primary target of the new weapons. The converse is true of China, which invokes and exaggerates the military threat from the United States to justify its own military budgets and weapon systems. The same contrivance is used by both countries to justify other expenditures. For example, increased federal spending for research and development, preschool education, and infrastructure is defended as necessary to counter the threat from China. Beijing is less public in making this case, but it does make similar arguments, invoking an alleged threat from the United States. The net result is that the troubled relationship looks worse than it actually is. Why do I argue that the relationship is less bad than it appears? The short answer is that political and opinion leaders in both countries recognize that their systems are inextricably intertwined and interdependent. More accurately, they recognize that serious attempts to disentangle myriad public and private relationships would entail immediate and potentially destabilizing impacts affecting key sectors, influential constituencies, and public opinion. Cutting back and managing more tightly are judged to be necessary and possible. Decoupling is seen as too risky, too difficult, and too expensive. Both sides have strong incentives to manage the relationship and strong disincentives to allowing it to deteriorate too far. U.S.-China relations will remain fraught, probably for a long time. But they need not and probably will not run off the rails or spin into conflict because many constituencies in both countries have both determination and the ability to manage tensions, work around obstacles, and make the relationship work. We should be able to do better than that. Indeed, we must do better than that, better than simply manage the differences if we are to meet common challenges in a globalized world. I'm willing to bet that we will. Thank you.